Welcome back to another episode of the EXP podcast. I'm joined by my co-host, Luan. Hello. And we have two guests with us today, and we're going to be talking about the topic of design in environment art. I'm joined by Josh and Chris. Do you guys want to introduce yourself? Josh, why don't you go first? Hi, sure. So my name is Josh Van Zulen. I am a principal environment artist at Cloud Imperium Games. Um, so I'm mostly looking at stuff surrounding the environment topic and uh, more specifically in the hard surface kind of area. I'm Chris. Yeah, hi, my name is Chris, uh, Christian Doritz. I'm also working at the uh, Cloud Imperium Games. Uh, I'm a senior concept artist and uh, uh, formerly an uh, um, industrial designer, but now yeah, uh, um, a concept artist for the gaming industry, focusing mainly on the uh, uh, environment side on, uh, of uh, concepts. So uh, there, there's the, 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 the vehicle uh, side of concepts, and then I'm doing the, the environmental and props. Very nice. So um, with sci-fi stuff, you guys are both big kind of hard surface sci-fi people. Uh, we, we see a lot that people kind of struggle with um, applying concepts to their sci-fi work um, with intelligent design, thinking about things like form and function. So when you guys go about making an environment, whether it be like a concept or building one up in Josh's case, what are some kind of big things that you think about um, in terms of making something a bit more believable, even in these sort of fictional environments? I'll let you start this one, Chris. Yeah, um, I I think it's it's um, you, you can take it from from two sides. So um, speaking from uh, from the environment, uh, I'm leaving the the props a little bit on the side, the environment. I think the uh, um, the the most important part. Uh, um, for creating environments is uh, make it believable, right? So, um, for example, you're, um, you're, you're creating an, a, a sci-fi room or a sci-fi building or environment uh, that is more futuristic and sci-fi, right? So you want to you wanna convey the, um, the observer or the, the, uh, uh, the, the player, let's say we were creating an environment for, for, uh, for an interior. You want to make this believable, right? So um, you're trying to... Um, you 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 need to make this as believable as possible. Of course, it's, it's, um, it all depends on the the, the art style, what the, what the art style is, or what you're aiming for. But in most cases, um, I think what is lacking is the, the the believable side, right? So make it credible. And um, if you if you're having an, an environment, um, let's say we we're creating an uh, uh, interior for um, a, a boiler room, for example, and we have a boiler room, and um, you need to create an uh, interior for that. Um, the, the problems that arise with this, um, if, if you don't think about um, how this thing works, right? So what is, for example, the the piping? What is inside the piping in there? How does the piping look like? What is What makes it believable? Um, if, you, if you're um, ignoring all these uh, these uh, credibilities or the, the, the credible design um, to make this believable, um, it quickly turns into something uh, cartoonish or something non-believable. When you would see, in a, for example, in finished concept, you would say like there's something that doesn't make sense because the piping is off or um, the dimensions are off. Um, so it is it, it is very crucial or it plays a very big role to have to have an environment that that stands out as something that is believable. If you walk in, in there and you instantly see like, okay, this, this could work because I know where where the piping is and where all the, 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 uh, the working parts are. So um, I think that it is super important in, in, in that regard. And uh, the same can, um, you could just put the same on props, right? So if you're having a small prop set to sit in your environment, you want to um, take care about the same as the environment, right? So it should work, it should be believable. And uh, um, yeah, I think that's, that's the most important part, right? In that situation, are you looking more at, say, referencing or just studying how things work? Um. I think it's both. Um, um, so for a concept artist, the, um, the visual library, if you're, if you're concepting from, from your visual library, then it's mainly the, the um, seeing stuff. Um, so gather references. If I start on, let's say, again, the boiler room, then I uh, go in and search for references, like what a boiler could look like, what all these small bits and pieces in this room should look like in real life, and then I can put it on my sci-fi environment, right? Um, it's, this is uh, super important to to gather references, and then while you gather references, you always build up your visual library, right? So you don't have to search. In most cases, you can just yeah imagine those or uh, those 
those parts that you want to go, um, build inside. Yeah, for sure. They're and then it's like, it, it's like that delicate mix of um, believability and um, the tangibility of the space with its function, right? And, yeah. and making it look pretty in a, in a really designed manner, right? Yeah. So, and uh, this is kind of where the environment artists will ultimately come in once that high level vision of tangibility and kind of what the, that subject is of a boiler room and um, we'll take that interpretation where all of those kind of grounding uh, mechanics have been laid down by someone like Chris in this instance. And um, you'd add in that extra layer, that, that final layer of believability to it, where you would work out, um, things such as how do things connect together on a more micro scale? How does the human element factor into it and, and can complement it in a very um, uh, appealing way, but also while still maintaining that um, the ultimate design goal of the space, right? It's functionality in, in the case of a boiler, for instance, right? Which is, it's not going to look glamorous. It might look very pretty design wise because of um, the excellent work that the concept artist has done, but it's still ultimately functional. Yeah. And I think what is also a, a place, a big part is this in dimensions, right? So if you think about uh, um, all the objects that are around you or the, the room that you're in at the moment, everything is tailored um, specifically for humans, right? Or for human scale. So why is a, um, why is a door? as big or as, as, recti uh, as rectangular as it is? Why does a bike look like um, this? And so everything has uh, the, the dimension of uh, um, uh, specifically tailored for humans, right? Or in, in most cases. So um, ignoring those dimensions or the, the human scale in environments um, often leads to, an, uh, to a mismatch of all those proportions, right? So if you would make an, a boiler room that you, you don't need uh, much in a boiler room, or let's uh, say another, uh, another example for a kitchen, for example. Um, if, if you if you um, make this uh, make a room too big or too small, um, you uh, you will instantly notice what is some uh, what is off about the room or a prop you're working on, right? So um, you always have to account for those uh, um, those dimensions and those proportions because it's super important to keep uh, uh, keep those in mind, especially for environments. Um, if an environment is off, right, then yeah, there's something off. You you um, maybe you cannot tell what is off. But there's something that, that doesn't look right. That also leans into like um, the thing that a lot of people fall flat on when when doing sci-fi or even, you know, to a certain degree, stylized stuff uh, in the more cartoony vein of things where um, sometimes well, inherently sci-fi is not something that we see every day, right? You don't go to, uh, I don't know, your, your place of work and walk down a corridor that is completely made out of metal panels and has like a whole bunch of greebly machinery on it. I mean, maybe if you work for a, a video game company that has that, may, you might on your way in, but um, usually you don't see that sort of thing um, day to day. So that poses uh, the design issue of um, how do you integrate that scale that is so very important into an environment that people are inherently not going to be familiar with whatsoever, right? And that's where you're thinking about things that are familiar and integrating them into the design or um, in, in some way, shape or form into that um, environment is going to be key, right? So things like adding in doors, like Chris was mentioning, um, that is a really easy way of instantly connecting the viewer to a perceived scale. If you get the scale of that door wrong, it'll ruin everything because mm -hmm. people have a set idea of what that looks like and how big it is. The same goes for handles. The same goes for, funnily enough, like um, skirting boards around the bottom of like your house and stuff. People kind of expect that to be a certain size. And even that in an environment, if that's way bigger than it should be, it's going to ruin everything, mm. which is a really subconscious thing that people don't really think about and uh, ties in heavily into the way that like these things are designed. Yeah. I think a very good example is uh, um, if you're taking a, a concept for a props, for example, I see a lot of, uh, or a lot of times um, where um, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the often used panel line, right? And it's super easy to just draw in a line and call it a panel line or it's, it's a panel. Um, but in, in, in a sense of um, when, when you're looking at this from, from the dimension and the proportions, just adding a panel line, uh, um, it's, 
so much it, it is it's kind of it nails you down on to a proportion and if you're having a, um, a small object that is for example 10, uh, 10 by 10 uh, centimeters big and um, you had in a lot of pen lines and a lot of structural parts here and there and uh, um, visually it makes sense but then you look at the, the proportions and it is super off because uh, um, there's only um, that amount of um, realistic scale that you have for a panel line, right? Um, if, if we stay in the uh, in realistic um, uh, sci-fi art style and the same for screws and bolts and all that kind of stuff. If you add a bolt, then it should roughly fit the the, uh, the, real, uh, the uh, real life equivalent of it, right? So it is, it is it's super easy to strive away from, uh, from the uh, air quotes correct scale and to... Uh, um, use something that is simply wrong, right? But it, what, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, that's all right. Uh, what are some examples then in, in your guys' eyes, if let's say you're designing something uh, alien or very, very mythical or whatever, that doesn't have a lot of, let's say, railings or bolts or or even doors. Let's say it's a place that's quite, uh, I don't know, gravity is of, not of the essence and people can just float wherever they want. What are some things you kind of look at uh, to try and bring that high, I mean, dare I say, the human element back in? Well, it's a, it's funny, funny you say that. Um, <laughs> it's uh, something that I've dealt with um, in the past, but it's inherently the, the question's a bit of an oxymoron, right? Because to make something alien, inherently a human can't design it. So um, that's the high level level of bullshittery that you're dealing with. But ultimately, it's designed by a human, right? So, and humans are perceiving it. So, putting that aside, um, really, it's a complex issue where you want to put in the human element, but not to the point where it obviously looks human, right? So, ultimately, yes, you're still putting it in, but you're not putting it into the point where it looks human. So, um, that's where you would start using, um, depending on the art style, I guess, but you would use shapes that n are not necessarily affiliated with man-made structures, yeah. right? So, and obviously, that is also very hard because humans make a whole bunch of whack shit. So... Um, you really need to be kind of uh, intelligent in the way that you incorporate these different kind of things. But like bringing that relatability back into a, um, a, a an alien kind of design aesthetic is something that is incredibly hard to do. I mean, there's a re there's a reason why H.R. Geiger's work on Alien is so renowned because he brought in the familiarity of basically like the human body and anatomy into an alien art style and just presented it in such a way that was just completely bonkers and unrelatable, but it was still relatable, right? And that is the essence of good alien design. Yeah. With concepting out um, pieces like this, uh, how much kind of work as a concept artist, Chris, do you put into mm. kind of solving um, a lot of the kind of smaller details? Do you, do you generally work a bit more kind of high level and looser or do you find yourself kind of going in and, and adding those small details for the person making the the prop or, or scene um hmm. um i would say it depends on the task that I'm, that, that I'm working on um but in general um all these smaller details um uh, like i said in a minutes ago with the with the pen line or the bowls i wouldn't would not take care about um, all of those details it is something to uh, uh to let someone else uh, um imagine it it is just more about the the general idea and the general concept of uh, um or uh, uh, general silhouette and look of a concept right so i, I wouldn't go in and, uh, um, and and give too much detail it's just about uh, um, a little bit about uh, um, surfacing and material definitions and all that kind of stuff um, in a broader sense yeah paneling or where is uh, um, how the forms react uh, uh, with each other but all the smaller details uh, um, I mean, we we all we all know it. Um, you, you get very dis uh, very quickly distracted with all these small details. And if you if you start on on something and um, giving it here um, a small line, there uh, another material definitions, here some some screws and bolts or some some inlets or whatever, then you you will never finish uh, finish something, right? So I tend to um, when I when I when I'm concepting something. In the end, uh, then I would do my my very quick um, overpaint pass and uh, just quickly uh, um, uh, uh, draw in some. If I have uh, bolts, for example, and quickly draw them in, just just a very 
quick brush stroke and it's, it is not even defined, right? And uh, this would then already be, be finished. Um, of course, there are, uh, um, there are other concepts, for example, weapons or vehicles they, uh, uh, that need a little bit more definition and you have to um, define all of that. But um, for my, for, um, especially for environments, um, I, I can be um, super loose about that because I have to, to um, bigger things to attend to or bigger, bigger rooms to, to look at you. And if I had need to go into detail for all of the rooms, that would be simply too much. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when like your, your typical environment artist is going to come in and interpret that yeah. and add those details, right? Like those yeah. implied areas will exactly. get resolved at that point in the process. And that's kind of where environment artists can go in and, and have fun. If, if they've been told to follow the brief to the dot, like they can still have fun on that because those, those smaller details haven't been as clearly defined. Yeah, because I think it's, it's, it's a back and forth, right? So I don't want to be a, be a concept artist that is uh, defining 100% a concept. Um, it, it takes away so much uh, freedom and so much uh, um, interpretation from, from an environment uh, artist or a prop artist. So. Um, you can, of course, I mean, it, it's, this is something interesting to figure out, to figure out uh, where something, um, what, what design looks like or what the, the last 10 or 20% of a concept looks like, right? So, um, yeah, if, if you have good artists, then uh, they will know what to do. And if they have a sense of a design or a, a sense of concept, then they're totally fine with, with doing it themselves. So um, this is kind of like, yeah, playing the, the ball to each other, right? So, um, yeah, I think that's that's... So very good. Yeah. I mean, the, the complexities that come with sci-fi design as well, like, yeah. like, like you mentioned there, Chris, like you, you kind of need to have a certain sense of uh, your, your design fundamentals to, to even interpret the, the concept that's given to you when, when dealing with sci-fi. And I mean, any real stylized kind of artwork that isn't an re- interpretation of real life, really, um, because these things don't exist. So um, there's a, there's heaps of instances where that, that back and forth gets um, quite frequent as well, because there might be like the concept gets integrated um, and then you'll find that it, it fundamentally just doesn't work in one area because yeah. of X or Y reason. And so um, the, the concept artist might not necessarily be on that specific thing at the moment, or they might be on an, another thing, right? Like oh, yeah. everyone's busy. So that's where like the two departments will, will have a, 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 a a line of communication where they can kind of speak um, through all of the problems and, and figuring it out uh, yeah. design wise together still. So it's still a very collaborative thing. I mean, at least, at least where we're working, right? Like it's um, the, the, the stuff that we have to deal with the, the day to day is, is very, very collaborative and, and very complex um, at least with our um, design directive and um, art styles that we're, we're dealing with. So, it's quite fun. What yeah. are some ways that you can sort of, uh, I guess, enhance an artist's ability to, um, I guess, push the design or even just uh, put their own spin on it? Say they have the concept and they're maybe they're not the strongest with design. Are there some particular things that you can do to help them along? Um, so it's always a tricky one when you give someone kind of a, a bit of key art and then tell them we want this, but not this, right? Like every, every artist has kind of heard that at some point in their career or heard someone else t- talking about it. It's really frustrating. I got this concept piece, but they don't want that concept piece. Right. So it's always a very difficult thing, especially for, for production artists that don't really know necessarily what that means. Um, so it's, uh, trying to help someone relay uh, through that feedback and that direction is um, is interesting because, like, you might get given um, a I don't know uh, what a good example is. Is like I don't know you you want this you get given a picture of a boiler room, but it needs to look like a kitchen. <laughs> For whatever I reason, they right? use those two oh. uh, examples. <laughs> I mean, I'm going back to it. I'm, I'm thinking on the fly here. So, like, okay, so how do we inter- how the how how are you going to interpret those grammatically different things, right? Like, so um, that's where um, I mean, you could eat quite easily uh, hit up your local concept artist to kind of um, uh, bounce ideas there, um, but it's it's kind of thinking through a thought process. Um, at least the way that like I would approach that and encourage uh, the artists I work with um, to approach it is think about the similarities, right? Like um, 
a kitchen has a whole bunch of um i'm talking in like the most simplest of forms here right like not similarities as in like you could have a, a pressure cooker in a kitchen and a pressure cooker in or a boiler right which is basically a big thing full, filled with steam um but like in the ba most basic sense of of shapes and forms, right? Like, so the kitchen has lots of pots and pans. A boiler is basically a big pot for water, right? So you can kind of uh, bring these two uh, ideas together in a very interesting way where you might have a, a let's let's convert the boiler into something else, right? So the boiler, it's still going to be a boiler. The, the basic forms and of the shape of of the room are going to be basically the same, but it's going to be a kitchen, right? So that boiler, all of a sudden, we could maybe make a big, you know, out of this world pressure cooker, or maybe it's an oven, right? So this is where we're like we're interpreting it's this, but not this. Mm. <laughs> in in that manner of speaking, it's a way of at least breaking down that process, right? Mm. I think if you if you were and working in a um, game studio environment. Um, or an already established game game studio environment, you have a lot of references to look at. Uh, um, there, uh, maybe the studio has already developed something, or there's there's already an art style or art direction. Um, so you, you you can always draw upon those stuff, right? So already established uh, uh, finished assets or um, asset, um, finished environments, or from the art direction. So you you have um, I can imagine you have you have a lot of uh, um, a lot of yeah, inspirational pieces to to. To go from one piece to another one without um, having to pretty much loop back the whole uh, um, the whole idea to a concept art team, then the next team, next team, next team, and then loop around all, um, all of a sudden. I think that uh, um, having uh, this kind of freedom to um, to interpret something in there and to maybe change ideas on the fly um, without going the whole loop again. I think this is uh, this is um, yeah super great um, or it's, it's super interesting. Um, And especially if you have the, those kinds of references at hand, right? Mm. Yeah. As like a, a sci-fi artist and, I mean, me personally being um, a design enthusiast, I guess in a manner of speaking, it's it's a really fun way of working, right? Because you, you will have a, a concept, a bit of key art, and then the direction is this is what we want, but we want it everywhere. But mm. you don't have a, a piece of concept art for every single image, right? And because... Um, at least in in um, the context of uh, the sci-fi that Chris and I are used to producing, it's it's very deliberate, right? You can't. There's no real room for uh, two objects just completely crashing into one another. Mm. Definitely happens, right? It's a video game. We 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 have to get it made at the end of the day, but it's we we try and avoid that as much as possible. So there's a lot of consideration put in for how all these different objects and shapes uh, work and, and talk to each other in different contexts. So that means that everything is fundamentally designed at the yeah. end of the day. It's not just slapdash thrown in there with a, with a, with a modular kit or just kit bash from extra components. There is a, there is a component to that, but it's still like you will take that, that bit of key art that um, someone on, on the concept team has produced. And then you're going to reinterpret that, into a completely different context mm. and that's where like the fun uh for an environment artist or even a prop artist right if there's a, a variation of a prop that needs to be done can come into play right yeah so yeah on the topic of uh, this but not this um obviously a lot of a uh, a lot of artists will follow something that's uh, sort of already pre-established. Let's uh, use Star Wars here for uh, for the sake of the argument. Uh, what are some traps you think people fall into when trying to create something original? Do you think people over-reference? Do you think people aren't adventurous enough? Like, is there anything that you guys would avoid personally? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think that's, that's actually a good idea to um, to reference too much I mean, to to a certain certain point, it is it is uh, it is it just good to reference or just logical to reference. Um, we all started with referencing or having one of our favorite artists doing some work, and we're like, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do. Uh, I want to draw a nice mech. I want to do uh, draw a nice vehicle or an environment or an, uh, whatever character. And um, every one of us has our uh, one of uh, one favorite artist, right? So, and at one point. We all um, copied them over at one point, right? 
So it is it is a starting point, and uh, um, you should always reference other artists uh, um, because this is also how you learn, right? Um, but at one point, you should develop then your 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 own art style or your own workflow and your own uh, way of working or how you work, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think it's it's I I, I mean you still today uh, um, or uh, um, I'm still referencing other artists, and when I see some some other artists, some other great artists, then um, I want to not only copy them, but I want to want to learn how and what style they're following, and how can I how I can follow this one in my day to day work, right? So um, it is it is always a little bit of copying and uh, mixing your own art style in this, and uh, I totally uh, <laughs> railed away from the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Focus, Chris. Focus. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, um, so to, to kind of uh, reiterate, basically, what ways uh, can you sort of what traps or things that you should look out for when ah, you're trying yeah. to be original without referencing too much? Yeah, yeah. It is. It is uh, um, to, to bring it down a little bit. Uh, just reference a lot of different artists um, without copying too much, right? Um, if that makes sense. So you're taking a bit, of, uh, a little bit of this artist, a little bit of that artist, a little bit of this IP, and you're mixing in your own ideas. Um, it is hard to explain uh, um, how that could look like for your project at the moment. Um, it is such a, um, such a great topic, um, but it's seeing a lot of different styles. I think um, then you will develop your own style um, no matter what. Yeah, I think it's something that is, I mean, there's definitely certain styles which are more obvious, mm. right, that certain artists do. Um, it's, I think it's a bit more evident in um, in the concept arena, but like it, as, as like a, in the environmental prop to kind of area, stylization of your own art is, I, mean, I say stylization as in like your own kind of, I guess, IP as you will. Um, it's It's a bit more difficult to kind of come come to grips with there's a, there's a lot of artists out there that do it very successfully but that doesn't mean that anyone's artwork who is uh, more subtle in its appearance um isn't successful as well right so uh it, it comes down to a lot of different things uh this, a lot of the stuff that chris mentioned and also just like the individuality of the person themselves right like um ultimately like you may like a specific thing more than another person so that will show up a lot more in your own artwork right like that's your own personality being projected into your artwork right and that doesn't mean that you can't like like chris mentioned in his tangent that you can't look at another artist's work and um bring that into your own thing and remix it with the things that you like as well, right? To create something unique. Ultimately, everything is a remix though. But um, when when you can pull something out of, of thin air that is truly unique and different from everything else, then like that's when it's incredibly rare first and foremost, but but like that's when true magic happens. So, uh, and only the, the true kind of greats can, can get there. But um, it doesn't mean that we don't all strive for it, right? <laughs> yeah. In that sense, would you let's uh, let's say someone's listening to this and they're just trying to uh, sort of get into, I guess, designing their own things or making their own, let's call it IP a little bit more. Would you encourage that they do a little bit more of um, I'm not, don't want to call it fan art, but the uh, more like practice of studying other pre-existing styles uh, before sort of jumping into making something completely new or would you say like just go and try and build something and see how you go i mean i think that if you fundamentally want to build your own art style because that's basically what you're doing you're building your own ip art style you need to understand what makes up other art styles to begin with right like understand what makes star wars a star wars thing what makes alien an alien thing like and then those two ips are dramatically different from one another right but like it goes beyond just one being icky and one being lots of oblongs it goes beyond that it's like the individual elements that make up the broader rule set of that art style once you understand like the the framework of how you can construct that art style that's when you can start to build your own pieces into it right because ultimately you want to build something like we were talking about earlier that is tangible so when you're when you're thinking about that world 
um, the rule sets that apply within that world. So um, how if you if you, if we're building like I don't know um, a civilization, how that civilization constructs its buildings, why they do what they do, the cultural impact of that. And um, I mean, maybe the cultural reasons why they, they build things certain ways that they do, right? This is building that framework to develop their own kind of style within this universe. Yeah, pretty much did. I mean, uh, there, are, there are a lot of projects or a lot of IP already out there that are successful. So um, if you're really starting from, from scratch as a new IP and that it's growing ever bigger and growing, uh, you wanted to... to um, to, to blow it up or make make it really big then you, you should you should, you should research um, what makes a, a, a specific ip successful or what is uh, uh, not successful if it's just a small project or um, a, a small rp that you're working on then uh, having too much research uh, um, will kind of track you away from uh, from your work too much um, but it's if it's a, a bigger sense then then look at other projects, look at what, what others have done and why is it su successful. It doesn't mean to, to copy uh, um, stuff over um, directly, but just as, the, um, as a general idea what makes it uh, successful and then integrate uh, um, the success into your project, right? Um, if that makes sense. It is, uh, sure. it is always uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, just looking and uh, um, a feeling of what is, uh, what, is, what is out there and finding your own unique selling point for the project you, you, you're working on. Um, yeah. So when you're designing something like a prop, for example, um, what kind of balance of form and function do you kind of aim for? Because um, ideally, I guess you want something that, that definitely looks like it works, but you know, how far do you really have to go with that um, without kind of compromising that, that um, interesting design and, and shapes that you perhaps you want to include? Yeah, um, I can say I'm, I'm coming from a, uh, from industrial de design standpoint, and for me, um, the function was always in the foreground. It always has to be functional first. Um, this is this is the way how I, how I learned industrial design or product design, and uh, this is the, the way how I worked. And um, I kind of put this on my concept art. So I always look at um, look at the, the function first, or look at the um, the general idea first. If the uh, if the idea is working. Then I look at the, the forms and uh, um, look at the aesthetics. But uh, the most important part for me is, is always looking at the, the function and uh, um, just made for maybe for a prop or an environment. So the environment should be believable. Uh, talking again about the dimensions and the proportions, this should be set in stone first. If this works, then I can go in and uh, give a little bit of uh, fluff objects. I can go in and uh, um, give it more details, more uh, uh, yeah, artistic um, styles, right? And the same for a prop. The prop needs to work on its own before I give it any details. Um, so I think this is this is uh, um, for me the, the the most important part: the the function. Right? Yeah, it obviously like depends on what art style you're going for. Oh, too, definitely, right? yeah, yeah, like, yeah, definitely. Like you, you could have a sci-fi that's just like, oh, I, I, how does this? I don't know, hand grenade work? Uh, it's it's oobly bloogy magic sci-fi stuff. Yeah. Right, that that can just be the art style. Like it's a bit more of a stylized interpretation of real life. You can totally have that as well. Oh, yeah, but it it really just depends. I mean, it's the same for um. No, not speaking uh, going going in fantasy. Um, like um, you you have a, you have a, um you have a bridge or you have a um a carriage, a horse carriage, right? You always look at how does the thing uh, um works first before you go in and give it a material read or give it a um, I don't know um other elements that that makes it. Uh, this kind of art style um yeah as, as josh said of course there's there's art styles out there that um that are looking more into the um, artistic direction before the function and having um weird forms or um ununiform forms or not logical forms first um before the function but uh, um so it, it 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 depends what what josh said it depends on the art so what you're working with um but um yeah yeah gen generally like yeah. i mean if you're if you're dealing with like realism then it's more often than not it's gonna be uh function follows well no other way around <laughs> uh, form follows function, form follows function yeah. yeah so uh especially with with smaller devices like i mean it, 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 it also kind of depends to a degree of like i mean maybe you're creating a prop for a consumer within your ip mm. so and consumer i mean like in in universe kind of 
consumer. So like that thing will probably have a little bit more lean towards form than function at, you know, at the expense of its function. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, it's up to uh, the mechanics of whatever your, um, the medium that you're working this in for it to show that. But um, yeah, it really depends. Like if you want something that's going to be a purely industrial application, um, like the, the boiler room we were talking about before, then it's 100% just going to be form. Yeah. Uh, function follows form. No, other way around. Fuck, I keep fucking around. <laughs> <laughs> Too many Fs. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's really confusing to, <laughs> to say that correctly. Um, on, on that sense, then, and obviously we've spoken a, lo a little bit about it uh, already before, uh, how, how much would you put function uh, in for something that has doesn't exist or has never been made especially in sci-fi i'm going to use the gravity lift thing again um how would you design a gravity lift nothing like that quite exists right so are you still trying to look for things that would make uh sort of the tropes i guess that make it look like it's a gravity lift or are you looking for things that are a little bit more tangible i'm gonna let chris do this one okay <laughs> um <laughs> so I, uh, um, I assume, let, okay, let, let's assume a gravity lift, right? Um, it could be just one uh, um, one lift that is just an uh, um, array of lifting up. But I would, would see when, when I hear a gravity lift, I would say like, okay, here we have a platform, right? So how does the platform look like? And I can, uh, uh, um, or how does the, um, where the gravity thing comes out or how um, does that work? If you remember on um, Simon Stallenhag, he has a lot of nice images um, Vehicles that are um, what is, is I think it's a Graflev um, is um, is the technology that he calls him. Um, so you can you can build around the technology about uh, uh, something like that or the the, the 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 what is it the gravity lift uh, lift for example. So how does how would this this work? So where is for example technical parts? What is under a lift? Um, how does it does it push himself up? Does it drag himself up? Where is for example, uh, um, some railings. Is there any panel lines or uh, sorry, um, any panels that that you would need to open where you where you have um, some maintenance or what is the electricity? What is um, how is this thing powered? Um, is this even powered or is this uh, something that it's uh, uh, um, getting from 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 straight air? So um, there's there's a lot of things that uh, that you can uh, uh, interpret in, in something like that. Um, so this is just something that I um, think about first when when I heard that right now. Mm. That makes a little sense. You're kind of just asking more questions about how this works yeah. rather than just knowing how it works because you've got the reference in front of you, right? Yeah, exactly. If, if you have nothing, uh, um, nothing you can, you can hold on or you can, you can grab to or you have no, no reference for this specific part, then uh, um, you need to make up your own rules and um, you need to see how, um, how can you um, yes, see those rules or those uh, um, that also... Um, how do I say it? Those dimen not dimensions and those borders. How can you define those borders for yourself or for your for your prop, and then uh, um, build from there, right? So you start uh, start rough and then go into detail. Yeah, for sure. And it's and then on top of that, like the final layer is like how you communicate that with yeah. with the person viewing, like your grav lift or whatever. Yeah. It's you, you've you've got to clearly communicate that. Once you've figured it all out and how it functions, you yeah. can then imply that to the viewer. If you've got something like that, that you you want these an environment full of things that that don't exist, um, you're talking about perhaps creating a technology for those things, like the kind of grav lift thing. Um, is that something you kind of think about in a broader sense of trying to link uh, your things together within kind of the fictional the fiction of of what you're doing? Um, or is it easier to sort of try to kind of uh, relate things to more grounded reference? It it really depends on like what you're trying to develop, right? Like, I mean, the example that I went into earlier when developing your own, P, own IP is or, or style is that uh, inherently things within a universe are going to have a similar kind of technology or way that they are built or presented, right? So uh, even if you are dealing with um, a civilization 
uh, like, I guess, Star Wars that spans across multiple planets, multiple star systems, it uh, inherently, as all of these cultures can intermingle, are going to in, going to share certain cultural aspects and certain design aspects in, in all of their artwork, right? And you see this across uh, civilizations in uh, the real world as well. Uh, you, you see um, uh, people like um, in... Uh, in uh, Native American culture, where Native Americans from the north of, of, of America uh, have similar cultures to the south. And now that's because everyone moves around and stuff as well, but it's uh, because they're all roughly within that same area, right? So you're not going to ever have a, um, a technology in a uh, environment that is going to be completely different and uh, basically circumvents uh, one in another part of the same place. Because if you've built it once here, it's not going to fundamentally reinvent the wheel over on the other side, right? But in the same vein, you could also want to do that. Where, you, but that's when you're you're you have to inform the viewer as to why you're doing these different things, right? Like, if you have, let's say, a spaceport um, is a classic example where this is where you're going to see lots of multicultural different manufacturers uh alien races all of these things intermingling right so you can all of a sudden propose uh, the concept of a human gravity lift and an alien gravity lift right these two things will be fundamentally um visually portrayed in two different ways right mm. I think that's also um, if you're working in a um, in, in a studio or working for clients, uh, so working professionally, then in most cases you can um, if you if you're stuck, then you you can always um, rely on the client or your um, your game studio or your art director or design, right? So you can always ask uh, um, ask if you're stuck or is this technology? How can we solve that? And uh, getting all the details or the information that you need to create uh, um, your art piece, right? So you always can rely on other people to help you out in this regard. When you're um, working uh, solo or working on uh, um, on just your uh, um, your personal project or whatever, and, <clears throat> and I think it's 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 a good idea to um, have a kind of a red line between all your works, right? There there's, there are a lot of artists out there um, where you look at different uh, um, pieces of um, of art or um, different projects they've been working on. I'm just, I'm just speaking purely of uh, um, personal stuff. Then you always um, have a red line and see like, okay, he's he's using this, for example, technology in in this project, and you see the next project is kind of um, working with this technology. And the best example, um, what I've given already, is uh, Simon Stalinhardt's work. Um, you see the the Graflev uh, vehicles, the these round dishes around the cars, and you see them everywhere. Or in in most of his works, there are obviously the the um, regular cars, but um, then you have the Graflev uh, uh, cars. And they're in, in a lot of his works, and you always have a red line of that you can follow. And this is uh, this type of um, um, technology, and you will always see it again and again. And um, so you can, can do the same with your um, personal stuff. Um, if you have one example of uh, um, technology, you can, you can just use it somewhere else and um, kind of guide your, uh, the viewers but, um, through your work, right? But in most cases, you can you can rely on your um, art director or your or your clients, right? On a slightly different note, um, I want to talk a little bit about paint overs and their kind of place in the process. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I guess both of you will have like a bit of a different perspective on here. But um, I guess we can start with Crystal. Sort of, when when do you when do you sort of come in and and do a paint over is this something that generally you're requested to do or are there certain times where you sort of say hey I'll, I'll hop in there if you just send me a screenshot and i can i can come and do a bit of paint over um it's it's kind of different so sometimes it is requested um a paint over let's say i get a picture of a door or um an entryway and uh, um, it is just some 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 rudimentary block outs and um i just uh, need to create some ideas, just some some quick ideation. Then I will go in and uh, paint over this uh, uh, this initial block out. Um, but there are also cases where uh, um, I finish a work and then give it an overpaint or paint over. Um, this is then mostly for for key arts. It's just the 
the last step of finishing finishing an art. <clears throat> but there's also times where I do uh, um, paint always myself. I just uh, um, do some quick 3D works, um, yeah, render it out as a JPEG and then paint over it. So um, it is it is either requested or I do it myself. Um, it is same when I um, when I work with a team and I see something nice or someone needs help. Um, then I, I really like to to just grab a screen grab and just paint over and give some ideas. Um, because it is super interesting for um, for me or for myself to to learn to just work from uh, uh, from from other people's work, right? I can just iterate on ideas and uh, um, you yeah, just train this uh, this ability. So um, I will often just grab a, a screen grab and paint over it. Yeah, it's um, doing paint overs is, is, is an interesting process because you can kind of you, you've got a base that the artist has already provided yeah. that kind of gets you. It skips all the the uh, complicated high level stuff, and mm. it can it kind of just let you focus on something that will just make it pop a little bit more. Yeah. It's like a it's like a song remix, right? You take the original song and then you remix it um, to hopefully be better. Sometimes not, but um, usually <laughs> in, in the interest of making it better. But um, I mean, on, on the production side of things, um, paint overs are, are integral to the process of just creating, like in, in any kind of uh, style or environment. Um, there's always going to be times where y an artist is faced with an issue where they, they, the space isn't working, they've designed something or just interpreted something. And uh, even just like if straight, if they copied a bit of key art, right? The art director said, just make exactly this. This is how I want this to look right. And then it gets implemented and it, it just doesn't sit right. It doesn't work. Mm. They don't really know what it is. But you've got ten million other things to do, and you can't, you don't have time for it right now, right? Yeah. Like rather than noodling on on the one thing in three D or or in editor for however long, you can either step back from it and just look at it from the high level yourself by doing a paint over yourself, or if you if you straight flat out for time, and this is what, what I did literally like a couple of months ago. I asked Chris to to give me some ideas on something. And I said, I, I'm kind of stuck on this right now. I don't have time to figure it out. Um, can you can you quickly spitball some ideas? And like Chris, being a, an actual professional concept artist, <laughs> he can just he can just crank these things out, right? Like, I, I'm I'm good at design, but I'm a little bit slower because I'm not sitting there every single day doing it. I'm I'm still pushing polys at the end of the day for the actual game product. But um, in that instance, it was super helpful uh, because. I can help solve my issue and um, go back in when I do get a spare moment and finish that task off. Or I could have paused that task, you know, so I still have time remaining on it or whatever. But like that's super important. It also like means that in um, in reviews or, or uh, if your if your friends are looking at your personal work, if we're not talking professionally, they can just you know you can shoot them an image saying, yeah, I'm kind of kind of digging this, but something feels off. Or maybe they just straight up have a cool idea. And then, like like Chris was saying before, they can just noodle on it and, and shoot you back something quick. He's like, "I like it, but like these elements here could be uh, could be pushed in this way." Or, "What do you think of this?" Right? And um, it's it's like it, like to bring it back to the music analogy. Analogy. It's not saying that um, the artwork is fundamentally broken necessarily in every instance. It's just remixing the idea to come up with something different, something fresh in a quick manner. Yeah, it's super super beneficial for for both sides. Um, as I said, I really 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 like this uh, this kind of working, this super quick ideation, right? Uh, just getting getting a um, just a raw JPEG and then going in with my smudge brush and uh, uh, try something out, right? <laughs> and then copy it over. Next one, brush something, and I ah, this looks like crap. <laughs> and uh, doing over and over again. Right? This is this that's the one you never show us, right? Yeah. <laughs> This is when you hear me giggling, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is this is super beneficial uh, um, for uh, um, yeah for for the environment artist or for me because I can can quickly get uh, get my ideas out right, and it doesn't mean that um, uh, that a concept has to has to uh, be followed one hundred percent. It's just well, I give the ideas and maybe someone else takes these ideas or scraps the ideas. It is uh, um, that's it's just the way it is. Um, so. Maybe some some other concept artists get a, a little bit butthurt over it um, when when the concept gets scrapped or uh, um, they're not following hundred percent. It's 
it's it's just the the matter of it. It's like that's how it is. Yeah. I mean, look at the end of the day, especially when you're dealing with these very um, stylized art styles, right? Like mm. sci-fi is fundamentally a stylization of of art, yeah. uh, and and falls into that category. So if if an artist comes in with an absolutely breathtaking piece of design work in any manner and then the artist goes in and and interprets it differently i mean it's 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 a number of different things uh to start off with right where uh i mean that artist might not necessarily be as skilled as as the designer who designed it Mm. for one but also also and this is more often the case it's just that the concept fundamentally didn't work in practice yeah, and that's why it looks different. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why um, uh, more cartoony uh, st- styled uh, concept pieces often look really odd when implemented in 3D, right? Mm. They look fantastic when they're in their 2D format on a sketchboard. Yeah. They're some of the best looking concepts out there just because of the style is really nice and pleasant to look at, but they always look kind of rubbish when interpreted in, interpreted into 3D. Mm. And it's because of a number of different things. It's one, it's hard to interpret that, a stylized yeah. concept in that manner. But also two, is that um, it's just a different, you're interpreting one style into a different style. So it's just going to be perceived differently and it just doesn't work. It's not because of the artist's skill. It's just you're, you're interpreting photorealism uh, from, a, from a cartoon. So that's it's a very complex thing for sure we have now been chatting about design stuff for 50 minutes so i'm gonna jump us into some patreon questions i think we have some really good insights there um especially talking about some kind of more niche or or perhaps more nebulous concepts that people kind of struggle with a little bit um so talking of things people struggle with and get confused about our first patreon question (laughs) comes from silk and it's what is a principal artist yeah so i mean this is one that a lot of people don't really kind of know about because it is a a bit more of a a niche job title so um uh, basically uh it tends to arise in companies that are a lot bigger or have um the need for someone in that position so um SCIG where I am, we have a principal artist, but um, in the same vein, um, I basically do the same thing that a expert artist at Ubisoft may do, right? And that's basically a principal artist, but they just have a different title for it, right? So um, it kind of can change based on which studio you're at because it is one of those uh, things that kind of uh, arises out of a necessity, so it can change quite a lot, but from my experience, um, it uh, can basically uh, come about because you have a need for an artist to understand the fundamental principle of the style and have the team understand what they need to make and um, make it to the best of their abilities without the need for uh, excess amount of time being dedicated into kind of just the more um, uh, brain hurdy side of just making art where uh, you might go in and a, a principal would look at establishing kind of the general uh, pipeline for, I don't know, just basic modeling, right? Like if you're an expert model or a principal modeler, then you would be saying to the team, okay, so this is how we're going to model this, this thing. These are the tools that we should probably consider using. And this is how our workflow is going to be constructed. Right? So they'd look at something from that sort of angle. And at the same, at the same time, they'd be um, talking with the art director uh, about what the requirements are for those for those styles and interpreting that uh, in a way that is easy and digestible for the rest of the team to approach. So um, that can be done through uh, stuff like benchmarks, right? So uh, that means that like 
setting uh, these benchmarks or visual targets, whatever you want to call them, would be done by the principal artist versus uh, someone who might just be a, a senior, mid or junior. Uh, that way that they have a more focused role in just developing that slice of the vision for, for the product ultimately. And that way they can take that um, benchmark, vertical slice, visual target, whatever you want to call it, and um, present it to the team in a manner that is easily digestible without all of the high level or in tandem with all the high level jargon that you get from the art director talking about the grand division, right? So it's kind of there just to help the process along um, in, a, in a broad sense. And I mean, that can change from, from company to company as well. So um, another thing that a lot of people kind of get uh, mixed up about too is that um, because it is an ambiguous role, a lot of people don't really necessarily know where it sits within the hierarchy of the company. And again, this can change depending on what studio you're at. Uh, but generally, um, in, in a lot of studios, what will happen is uh, when you're at a senior artist level, you'll have a, a couple of paths that you can take depending on what the studio is. And um, more often than not, it's a lead artist position or you have a principal artist position, right? And so, okay, what's the difference the two, between the two? So we've already talked a little bit about what a principal does and, and um, what their responsibilities are. And a lead, um, as, as you can probably assume from its name, is someone who's leading the team more often than not, right? So while a lead artist in some studios may do a lot of the stuff that the principal artist does, uh, in these specific studios, the lead artist might be um, so um, they, they might be managing a, a very large team, right? So they don't necessarily have the time to sit down and do these visual targets or they, they um, as, as it does happen quite a lot with artists when they're at that point in their career, they're happy to take a step back from the art side of things and just focus on supporting the team as a lead, right? And a, a lot of senior artists, like they want to keep progressing their career um, this is certainly the case for me, um, where they they don't necessarily want to go into a lead. I've done lead in the past, and it's like not for me, right? So um, I decided to to push my career direction in the principal artist direction. So that means we both, like the lead and and principal, um, can sit at the same level and work together to complement each other in that instance, right? So, um, but the lead is focusing more on supporting the team and everything that they need in the day-to-day -day scheduling and uh, figuring out uh, problems within uh, the, the actual production of the artwork. And then um, the principal can come in and um, solve the high level issues with the art direction and pipeline sort of things and supporting people um, with, with everything kind of in between that's not related to the delivery of the actual product, right? So, and then, I mean, both of those, those two roles can then ultimately go up uh, beyond that to um, whatever roles are available past that point, whether it be associate, art director or art director, right? So then neither of those are dead ends. They're just kind of different paths towards uh, that same goal. But like I said before, um, it really depends on the company because it can come out of necessity or it can be a luxury. Um, it really depends on, on what, what the company's needs are. Generally, it just comes from uh, the demand of the employees. A lot of people just want to push themselves beyond senior, right? Because a lot of us get to senior in like um, five to seven years and um, some even sooner. And then it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm at my maximum kind of potential. I don't want to be someone who's responsible for managing vast quantities of people. There's not a job that pops up for that every day as well, right? So there's many instances you can actually have studios where you'll have a lead for a team and then you'll have like a couple of principals as well. Like it doesn't need to be one-to-one. -one. So you can have multiple of these, but it's kind of like that higher level of team focusing on that higher level stuff. So yeah, hopefully that covers a little bit of the Fairly thorough. <laughs> we can answer, yeah. <laughs> Went into a lot of detail there. Okay, and we have another question from Cairo here. Uh, he's asking, what's the relationship at work like between a concept artist where the sky is the limit and a principal artist who knows the limit of the pipeline and tech needed to recreate said concepts? Is there a regular back and forth to determine what's feasible? 
Yeah, I think um, uh, we talked about it a little bit briefly. Um, so it's it's pretty much you, you always work um, with one uh, uh, another, right? So um, it is it is a back and forth. So um, yes, kind of like a sky's the limit, but um, I always have to uh, to account for uh, um, for what is actually possible in uh, in the game engine or if you're working in the other entertainment industry, what is what is actually possible, right? So uh, speaking of the of the games, I cannot. If I got a task of um, creating a, creating a big environment, then I cannot go total ham and uh, um, do whatever whatever I please to do, right? Um, because I have to to kind of look what is actually possible or what the the environment artist is actually possible to do later on, and what is what is not doable. So um, to a certain amount, um, it is um, I have kind of uh, more freedoms, but it's, it's just for um, as I said, um, idea generation. So I can I can present ideas that then other uh, um, teams or other um, the other departments then can draw upon. Let's say the UI or an environment or a prop or whatever. I give a lot of ideas or and try to to concept out a lot of ideas where other departments then can just cherry pick the best of those and um, see how that works. So um, yeah, but 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 I'm not having uh, um, too much freedom or um, I don't have that much freedom where I can say okay. I do everything I want now, and then let's see how the team is dealing with that, right? So um, I always uh, look at if it is even remotely possible. It is not; it's not technical. Um, so I'm, I'm not going in uh, engine or trying something or trying stuff out. It is just the the logical what is possible. Even if like if I get an, a three D model or a quick um, block out, and uh, I then go over and block out myself. So um, I kind of stick to some of the uh, um, at the borders that I have, <clears throat> so I always try to be reasonable, right? So, um, but it's 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 again it's a back and forth. To, um, there, there's a communication between uh, between those teams, or should be at least. Yeah, mm. I mean, there's like, when it comes to the concept of coming to the production team, right? Like, if if someone like Chris has done something. Uh, like a, a design or an art style for for something like a location or or whatever that is particularly crazy, like um, like Chris has um, had a had a really cool idea for a certain thing or the art directions like we want this place to just be very you know specific in one aspect or what an, mm. uh, another right like might be very different to what the team is used to working on, and that's where like it could you could potentially say that that is a risk right for yeah. the team like if you're if you're a team that, f that that focuses primarily on on doing hard surface environments uh, like made of metal right machined mm -hmm. manufactured elements and then the art direction comes in and says okay we, we now want to make an environment completely out of rock yeah. and and do it that way right like you go oh, yeah, rocks rock though like it's not too not too difficult i'm sure we'll be right at the end of the day and while that may be true um fundamentally you're going to be having artists that are used to dealing with metal coming in and doing rock mm. so and there's the, the process is there for manufacturing and, and designing and building uh, a very very different because it's a, a fundamentally different base material to begin with right i'm simplifying this down quite a lot but that's where um you would have the intersection between um, the art director, the concept artist, and the principal artist coming in yeah. and defining those things, right? The art director and the concept artist uh, will kind of define the in-law kind of limitations of what they can do and also the high-level engine expectations of what that is going to be. And then the communication between the the concept artist, the art director, and the principal is going to be, okay, how do we, how do we portray these changes to the team and establish a workflow for the team to be able to build this thing in an actual timely manner mm. and at the quality that is expected right yeah and i, I think it's also the, um, uh, to mention that uh, and the art direction is always uh, um, leading uh, leading all of the teams right so um it would just give you um, a lovely slip on the wrist if you're, if you're striving away from the from the target too much yeah. um <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah there's uh, um, again, for the for the freedom, it is uh, you're always in your boundaries, right? Unless you're working uh, in, in, on your um, own uh, uh, project, but it's a totally different story. But you always have your either leads or the art direction um, that is kind of pushing you in the direction, um, 
not specifically, not too much into detail, but uh, uh, kind of in the in, in right direction. So we always have something to rely on. And uh, again, the lovely <laughs> slap on the wrist. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're familiar, Chris. Well, that's part of my job, no? <laughs> getting bashed. <laughs> I've slapped Chris a few times in many places. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, on that note, I think, Luan, uh, it's time for your thing. Yep. So we have two additional questions here. Uh, one of them is specifically for Chris and one of them is specifically for Josh. Chris, um, um, what is your favorite bread and why? My favorite bread. Oh my God, no. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. No, it's a hard question. Oh shit, yeah, man, there are so many, there are so many br uh, breads out there. <laughs> <laughs> Is it is it a moldy bread? It is not moldy. Um, <laughs> Josh is always mocking me that I eat moldy bread. I don't, I do. just a little bit. Um, I, I would probably say sourdough. It is. This is this is the bread that I grew up with. It sounds like I got raised by bread, but <laughs> <laughs> grew up in a room full of sourdough, dude. Yeah. <laughs> in my some uh, say it was his bed. Yeah, it was actually in a pillow in my in my crib. So. <laughs> No, so I we're see. going with sourdough. That's the sourdough, official. final answer. Final answer. Okay, that's uh, 50 pounds. Um, Lock it in. Locked. Uh, and Josh, can you uh, explain to the listeners who may not have heard of it why a $2 bunning sa sausage sizzle is so good? Oh, dude. <laughs> Bringing me back to my roots. So, um, all right. So for those who, who don't know, um, um, and if you couldn't tell, so I'm, I'm from Australia originally. And um, in Australia, we have a store called Bunnings, and I suppose they're getting a little bit of advertising here. But um, in Australia, it's it's fairly common outside of Bunnings, which is a hardware store, to see a little pop-up, um, usually staffed with people selling a sausage in a in a bit of white bread with, and then you'd have like um, uh, tomato sauce and mustard, and uh, you'd go up and you'd pay a two dollar gold coin for them. And then you just go in and do your shopping. It's it's it it sounds really weird, um, but it's it's kind of like just a cultural expected thing when you go to to the hardware store, uh, specifically Bunnings, where you, you'd walk in and you just you just get a two dollar sausage sizzle on your way in, and if you're greedy, <laughs> you get one on your way out. <laughs> so, and um, I can't remember if the funds go to charity. I'm pretty sure that they do um, in general. Um, but it's, it's, I don't know. It's just kind of, it, it for some reason. Like, I mean, let's be real. Everyone loves a barbecue, right? <laughs> and if you can, if you need to go to the hardware store, being able to have a little bit of barbecue on the way there is, you know, it's just going to sweeten the deal, make it a bit easier. Must so a huge markup on them too. <laughs> yeah, they they've increased the price from two dollars to two dollars. How it's dare they? Crazy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's it's um a, a great little bit of Australian culture. Well, that's it. That's my two things. Tim, take us away. There we go. So thank you everyone for listening and joining us on our talk about design and uh, sausages. <laughs> Thanks, Lan, for Don't forget moldy bread. Co-hosting with me. Um and yeah. thank you very much to our guests, Josh and Chris, for joining us um this month. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. If you want to come join in with more EXP fun, head over to our Discord and join the daily discussions, uh, some of which might be about design, who knows. If you want to learn more from some other fantastic artists, head over to the website and read some of the great breakdown articles we've got up there. Other than that, until next time, have a good one, everyone, and see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.